God doesn't form alliances with her enemies and stab us in the back. God so often did to their people. No, he's a covenant-keeping God. He keeps his promises. And so he, he doesn't stab us in the back when we need him most. That's what the capricious pagan deities did, the whimsical demons. But we don't worship a pack of demons. We worship the holy God. The holy God. Holy. He's holy. In other words, he's perfect. He's trustworthy. He's reliable. This is the Holy One of Israel. This is what he's called in Isaiah and in the Psalms, throughout the Old Testament. I am the Holy One of Israel. I am perfect. I am the God of your fathers. I delivered, I delivered your fathers. I will deliver you. Um, it's easy to think of God as having acted in the past and then just now he's gone away or something. The Israelites probably fell into that. God, God brought us out of Egypt. David, David, David had grown up in the stories of Moses and Joshua, the promised land, and now he's about to get killed. He says, but, but he remembers what God has done in the past. He remembers that God acted in the past, and he trusts that God will act in the present. So, um, this idea, this theme in the Holy, the Holy One of Israel comes up in, there's a passage in Habakkuk I want to look at really quickly, that is so similar to Psalm 22 and, and, and totally rests on the, and trusts in the midst of calamity on God's impeachable character. In Habakkuk 1, the Babylonians are destroying Jerusalem. There's very much a similar idea of dogs surrounding the author here um, and, and, and inflicting violence on the people, destruction and violence. Um, uh, it, uh, it's amazing. Verse 2, talk, Habakkuk 1 says, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And will you not hear or cry to you violence and you will not save? Um, Verse 4, so the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth for the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. And then it says, it talks about how the Chaldeans are, and the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, are seizing Jerusalem, seizing the land. And they're, they're, they're coming in with their cavalry, and there's, there is the same animal imagery. Verse 8, their horses are swifter than lepers, more fierce than the evening wolves, their horsemen press proudly on. Verse 10, at kings they scoff and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress. That sounds a lot like when the people sort of trying to kill David. But what I want, the reason I brought us this verse is because this passage is because of verse 12. We see the same reliance on God's holiness as grounds for hope. Verse 12, are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my holy one? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as judge. Rock have established them for reproof. So God is is acting here, and if you've read very many Psalms, you'll learn to anticipate. You learn to anticipate, and I talked about how this doesn't follow just a strict lament psalm where he has his complaint. He vows. He asks God to punish the wicked. Because if you've read very many Psalms, you'll learn to anticipate harsh curses that the author hurls at his enemies, all right? Um, assured, and so, but assured of the rightness of his cause, he begs God to just unleash the full measure of his wrath on those who murder and mock the innocent. David, he wrote, he wrote Psalm 22, and this would consider his choice words he has for his own son Absalom in Psalm 3. Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. He's talking about his own son. David didn't have problems uh, confronting, asking God to judge the wicked. Occasionally, however, and this brings me to my third point, Sometimes vindication of the righteous is accompanied by the repentance of the wicked 
rather than their judgment. Even the style of imprecatory prayer, which characterizes the groanings of the oppressed, in so many psalms, you would expect to find David calling out a fire from heaven on his persecutors. You won't find that anywhere in Psalm 22. It would certainly have been appropriate. And, and the text doesn't rule out the possibility that God ju did judge some of David's enemies. That's not what David asks for. In what was perhaps his greatest hour of persecution, when his enemies deserved the greatest degree of punishment, he's silent. He displays deep sorrow, which nearly suffocates him, but not resentment. There are at least two reasons for this. In the immediate context, God's oracle of deliverance, the oracle of salvation I talked about earlier, overwhelms him in a way that interrupts his flow of thought. And secondly, absence of an imprecatory prayer here foreshadows the attitude of our Messiah. The one who was, who was to come and would be emotional, yet docile, refusing to call down angels who would break the wicked to pieces when he could have. But instead says, Father, forgive them. Greek, there's a continuous aspect that he says it again, and he says it again, and he says it again. Father, forgive them. He's hanging there, dying. It's on his mind the whole time. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. It should be noted, scorners, <coughs> scorners in the beginning of Psalm 22 must be, some of them must be included, must be included in a group who turn to the Lord in verse 27. They believe they are honoring God when they kill the psalmist. Indeed, they are his brethren to whom he will preach. He says, I will preach to my brethren. They are members of the assembly, and they are mocking, they are mocking this man, mocking the psalmist and in his suffering. There are certainly members of the religious assembly in the synagogue. Therefore, the people who turn to God in verse 27 include at least some of the individuals who sought to kill the author. Not everyone gets what they deserve. And the psalm seems to be okay with this. Um, we see an example of this at Pentecost, an event that follows the suffering of Christ in much the same way that the turning to the Lord of the congregation in Psalm 22 to 31 comes abruptly on the heels of the lament section. I'm not saying that the psalmist is talking about that event in this context, but it's an example that demonstrates the power of repentance as a result of remembering and turning to the Lord. This Jesus Christ, whom you crucify, is Lord and Christ. Repent and believe, and their hearts were, and they were cut to the heart. And thus, the Great Commission began to go forward. All of us were enemies of God at some point. As is the case with every unsaved person who's not heard the good news of Jesus Christ. Who needs it. And yet, we now celebrate God in the assembly. It is certainly fortunate for sinners, fortunate for sinners like us, that God does not always break the wicked to pieces. Sometimes he rescues us from our that in the life of the Apostle Paul, whose, 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 whose former life certainly uh, mirrored the actions of the dogs that are described in the, in, in the, in the, in the beginning of Psalm 22. He arrested Christians, persecuted, and killed them. Witnessed the killing of Stephen. gospel of God in such a way that would then cause what happens, what happens, the whole earth turn, will remember and turn to the Lord. So, as we see the continuing relevance of this psalm in profound ways, um, I just wanted to, just, um, in closing, to apply some things. I just, don't take, please don't take corporate worship for Instead, praise God with other believers with the understanding that you are making the descriptions of world 
why worship can be song of reality. It's a weekly reality. When we come together, people of God, and worship Christ. shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation and shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. Additionally, when we see a promise that as long as the earth endures until the coming of Christ, there will be faithful faithful worshipers of God. And finally, earnestly pray and genuinely hope for the salvation of those who hate your life. really hard to love your enemies. It's hard to focus on God deliverer and not all the circumstances. But don't allow the sorrow to turn into resentment. But try to have the attitude that was the experience of David and our Lord Jesus. We quoted this passage. Thanks, John.